Wow. That did not last long. I didn't even get a chance to watch all of those movies in the new DC Tomorrowverse before it's now being brought to the end. Well, the Dekamu did also end before I decided to start covering them, but at the very least that lasted over half a decade. Tomorrowverse is not even old enough to be put in the kindergarten yet, and it has only one actual adaptation under its belt, but it's now being taken out to pasture with a continuity reboot a la Crisis on Infinite Earths. And now that I got to it, Crisis on Infinite Earth is a 12-issue limited series that came out in 1985 and 1986, written by Marv Wolfman with the late George Perez doing the art for it, just like with the new Teen Titans Judas contract. Back in the 1980s, DC Comics as we know them had been around about rallah half a century and had a lot of comic history, as well as so many different imaginary Elseworld stories with multiple multiple alternate characters that the main continuity, aka Earth-1 at the time, might as well not have mattered. And the concept of Earth-1 existing with Earth-2, 3 and so on was done to, essentially, replace Batman and Superman with younger characters, because aging in real time had caused the former to die and the latter to grow grey hairs. I talked about this briefly in my Crisis on Two Earths video, where it was pretty much that Earth 1 was the Silver Age world with the Justice League of America, Earth 2 was the Golden Age world with Justice Society of America, and Earth 3 was where the villainous crime syndicate of America lived in. Other random Earths included Earth 4 with the Charlton characters, aka those characters who inspired Watchmen, Earth 5 or Earth S, where Sazam, when he was still called Captain Marvel, lived with his family, Earth X, or just Earth 10, where World War II never ended with Uncle Sam and the Freedom Fighters, and so on. Then there were also the lettered worlds like Earth E, where the original Super Sons existed in, and Earth B, with stories not wanted as canon. Like one story where Catwoman was an irredeemable murderer. You can probably imagine why people like Marv Wolfman probably decided to ask at this point, do any of these imaginary stories matter enough to justify their existence? And that as a long story to be told short, led to the culling of the DC's infinitely uncountable amount of parallel universes to be singled out to just one singular continuity that from 1986 to 2011 was called the New Earth. That is when the Flashpoint happened and the New Earth became the New 52's Prime Earth. I should also mention that this story randomly brings up different characters here and there without committing to a fixed point of view character. That is going to affect the story commentary as you might be able to imagine, and seeing how this is a 12 issues long miniseries, the animated adaptation has been also cut into three parts, not to rush and jam in all of it into just one 75 to 90 minutes long animated movie. I will also be doing the same thing by cutting this comparison review into thirds, similar to the three-act structure, which I already somewhat recognize the story would have when I went through it with Robert Chris Proteges Noob series. Basically, the story commentary in each part will be cut short when it reaches the point where the animated movie is close to a cliffhanger, and then I will switch out to talking about how the animated adaptation compares to it. After all three videos have come out, I will likely also make a super cut of all of them mashed together into one big video. And before anyone asks, no! I will not be acknowledging the CW's guys on Infinite Earths into this, other than as maybe a random footnote. Let's get on with it now. In the beginning, there was a single black infinitude, so cold and dark for so very long, that even the burning light was imperceptible. But then the light grew, and the infinitude shuddered, and the darkness finally screamed as much in pain as in relief. For that instant, a multiverse was born, a multiverse of worlds vibrating and replicating, and a universe that should have been one. 
became many. That was then. And so we are introduced to Pariah, someone whose backstory we can explain later. Witnessing as some random earth among the many in the multiverse is swallowed up by a wave of what will also be eventually explained. Pariah is so distraught by what he is witnessing that he has to express his thoughts out loud, while he is also unable to rescue even one person from the destruction and is then whisked away to witness on another similar site. His next stop is at Earth 3, the home of the villainous crime syndicate, who in the destruction of their world are pushed into the helplessly heroic roles in trying to delay the inevitable. While the heroic version of Lex Luthor flies through the destruction and witnesses how Owl Man, Sonic Quick and Superwoman are taken by the waves, Ultraman and Power Ring come across Pariah, who confesses in his distress that their situation is hopeless. So in the last moments of Earth 3, Ultraman decides to go out on his own terms in fighting the waves to his bitter end while leaving Power Ring to die alone, and Luthor returns to his wife to report that their world is gone. Before they perish, Luthor and his wife place their infant son into an interdimensional escape pod in hopes of sending him to Earth 1 to be looked after by the Justice League. But unfortunately, the escape pod lands on an abandoned satellite orbiting Earth 1, with no Justice League to receive him. Fortunately, there is another satellite inhabited by an unseen person named as the Monitor, along with a young woman named Lila. The Monitor delegates Lila to go retrieve the infant while explaining that he has analyzed many heroes and villains from past, present and future, who are now needed to fight together for their survival and are so too busy to play babysitters. Lila voices some displeasure from being bossed around, but ultimately goes to replicate herself into the ultimate multitasker by doing that thing that Tien Shin Han can do in Dragon Ball. This way, Lila as Harbinger is set all across time and space to look for those people the Monitor has analyzed and chosen to fight the upcoming threat. These people include Solovar of Gorilla City, Dawnstar from the Legion of Superheroes, Firebrand from the All-Star Squadron, Ted Cord's Blue Beetle who had just recently become a DC character, Supervivant Psycho Pirate to help negotiate Killer Frost to work with Firestorm without her consent, as well as some other heroes like Geoforce, Cyborg, Green Lantern, John Stewart, Obsidian, Earth 2 Superman, some guy named Arion, and supervillains like Simon and Doctor Polaris. But during this recruitment drive, one of those splintered parts of Harbinger is attacked by a shadowy entity to infect her, and then more of them attack the heroes and villains as they are brought onto Monitor's satellite. While Harbinger is formed back to Lila, she is too weak and infected to do anything while the heroes and villains try to defend themselves. Ultimately, after having managed to hold their ground and showcase how they fight, the Monitor appears to brighten the satellite's interior to drive the shadow creatures away, and starts to get down to business on why he has brought these heroes and villains together. Relatively at the same time, ancient past and far future are getting folded together, when a herd of mammoths directed by Anthro the First Boy run into Metropolis guarded by the Legion of Superheroes, before they then disappear with Brainiac 5 managing to analyze the situation to detect that there is an anti-matter wave on its way moving towards Earth. In the present day, Batman arrives too late to stop the Joker from having killed a copyright holder for silent movies that the Joker wanted for himself, and in the middle of their wordy confrontation, the Flash suddenly appears in a haunting visage, begging for help and describing the world dying around him. The Joker escapes as Batman becomes more focused on the Flash's appearance, before he then disintegrates before Batman's eyes. Then in returning back to the Monitor's satellite where he explains to the heroes and villains what the current situation is, what with the worlds dying one by one because of the expanding wave of antimatter, and only a few worlds are still left to save. The Monitor also has to deal with Firestorm and Simon who had previously come into contact with him in earlier stories, before the Earth 2 Superman calls order among themselves, and to hear the Monitor out so they can save their worlds, or at the very least take him down if he is lying. 
To monitor also by some trust by revealing that he is becoming weaker as the positive matter world's number declines. Meaning that the longer they debate among themselves, the more they will be wasting precious time. Lila has by now become the Harbinger again, and says that she will be taking the heroes and villains to five different time eras, where the Monitor has planted devices needed to buy them more time and that they need to protect. As she speaks, Arion notices something wrong with the Harbinger as a narrative reminder of her infection, and then they are all sent away to those different eras, while the Harbinger tending to the weakened monitor feels her infected urge to betray her father figure. Then in the middle here, we are shown how the Guardians of the Universe are taken off from the board, while Batman meets up with Superman in Metropolis to tell him about how he saw the Flash's ghostly visage, before Pariah appears before them to warn about the incoming doom, and then disappears to leave Batman and Superman even more confused. In the far future, Commandi the last boy on Earth climbs on one of these devices the Monitor has set up, before meeting the Earth 2 Superman, Solovar and Dawnstar as the shadow creatures attack and they need to work together to protect the tower. In the next scene, Harbinger is shown retrieving the infant from Earth 3, who by this time has aged up to an older toddler. Syntymästä asti ihmiselle valehdellaan. Nyt on ruma vauva. Annetaan silti yhdeksän miinus, ei voi ainakaan meitä syyttää. Tämä vale on hyväksyttävä, koska ulkonäölle ei voi mitään. In the distant past, Erion, Obsidian and Psycho Pirate arrive to another tower that is set in the middle of Atlantis when it was still on land. And while Erion and Obsidian move towards the tower to explain it to Erion's people, Pariah appears to the Psycho Pirate, who decides to take advantage of Pariah's distress to charge up his powers, and then hungry for power turns against his allies and Erion's people. Obsidian saves Arion into his shadow form while Psycho Pirate turns on the Atlanteans, before he is then mysteriously taken from the past to a black void where a disembodied voice coerces him into the dark side. The loss of Psycho Pirate is acknowledged on the Monitor satellite, and in needing to refill his position, the Monitor tells Harbinger he needs to create a new Doctor Light. Back near the Atlantis Tower, Pariah explains his situation in appearing to witness all the worlds as they are destroyed, which causes Arion and Obsidian to suspect the Monitor's words at the same time as the antimatter wave appears on the sky. In the Monitor's satellite, the Monitor is getting weaker as the world worlds are being swallowed by the antimatter, and Harbinger in her infection is shown to be reporting back to the shadowy figure who took Psycho Pirate. Then at this point, we have a gap between issues 2 and 3, after which the Monitor is shown to be analyzing the last son of Earth 3, who has been named as Alexander, and is rapidly aging as an after-effect from having traveled from Earth 3 to Earth 1. And while the Monitor is busy with the young Alexander, Harbinger with her infection reads it as him ignoring her, before reporting back to the shadowy figure with Psycho Pirate. Wherever they are, Harbinger Harbinger is told to betray the Monitor, while the Psycho Pirate is told to prepare himself to start emotionally manipulating people soon. Then we get to see the Flash for the first actual time in the story, running in a stormy future world with natural disasters that eventually get dropped from the priority list when Barry sees the approaching wave of antimatter approaching him in the distance and forces him to vibrate himself away to another era. To the present day New York, where the Teen Titans and the Outsiders are witnessing as a wall of antimatter is approaching them, and they can just barely hold the line as the civilians are running away from it. While trying to rescue civilians from a collapsing building, Donna Troy is almost crushed under it but is then rescued by Superman, who then also has to stop Starfire from fighting in vain, while Batman approaches the Titans and the Outsiders to inform them about what he knows. Then the Flash appears before them from the future, but he is then immediately being torn elsewhere, and while Batman attempts to pull Barry to them, Jericho rushes to stop Batman from being taken to where the Flash then disappears, again begging for help. Meanwhile in space, a sentient Brainiac drone is preparing itself for something that it needs Lex Luthor to join in, and then we move to 1944 Markovia, 
where Geoforce, Blue Beetle and Dr. Polaris join Sergeant Rock's Easy Company and the losers fighting seas hunt and to protect another one of the monitor's towers. And then the shadow creatures arrive to kill off the losers along with Sergeant Rock, while Geoforce and Dr. Polaris recognize that their situation is hopeless. Up on the tower, Blue Beetle is wounded while fighting the shadow creatures, and the observing monitor sends him back home to recover. The situation is no better in the far future, where another similar fight has fatally wounded Solomar, who also is implied to have been sent back to his home from Commandi, Dawnstar and Earth 2 Superman. Finally, in the Old Wild West, the fifth power is discovered by Jonah Hex, Batlash, Nighthawk, Johnny Thunder and Skullhunter, as they also come across Firebrand, Cyborg, John Stewart, Green Lantern and Psyman guarding it, and the Shadow Creatures attack them too in causing another losing battle, from where only Nighthawk manages to flee away to see the antimatter wave coming to swallow everyone in the time period. At this point, the antimatter wave is appearing everywhere with important characters seeing it coming, and the monitor, weaker than as he is getting, is confronted by Harbinger, now fully corrupted to kill him. But before we can get to that, we go from issue 3 to issue 4, where Supergirl finds Batgirl just observing from the distance how the antimatter wall is advancing, and how her morale is slow as she as a street fighter is not used to dealing with cosmic threats. John Constantine is drinking with Beast Boy stepdad, and Pariah is once again witnessing how another world is taken by the antimatter, with that world's family of heroes mistaking him for the cause of the destruction. That causes them to waste time on him, which ends up costing Lord Volt and his daughter to be taken by the antimatter, while Pariah, before moving on, manages to take Lady Quark to save at least her. Then we finally get to the part where the monitor manages to create the new Dr. Light. By manipulating the circumstances around a Japanese astronomer, Kimio Hoshi, who is introduced as a not very pleasant person, because she is beyond frustrated at being the smartest and most driven person in the room. TLDR The monitor fires light at the telescope Kimio is looking through and seen. While the monitor is then recreating Kimio into the new Doctor Light, Harbinger is slowly moving to kill the monitor, and Alexander senses that the monitor is expecting Harbinger to do it. Elsewhere, the shadowy figure who took Psycho Pilot is shown to also taking Red Tornado against his will to use him. Then we see Firestorm and Killer Frost on Earth choose Camelot, where Vandal Savage witnesses them teaming up with the Shining Knight, who fight the shadow creatures near another tower. In the sea transitioning, we can then see how the shadow creatures are combining into a colossal form, and the towers serving as tuning forks between the worlds and time eras make the heroes and villains around them see it. This makes them believe they need to destroy the towers to stop it, but by now the new Doctor Light has been added to the board, and she attempts to explain how the towers are really helping them as to throw it out. But not it's absolutely what they're behind. This is what unfortunately, because the previous Doctor Light was a villain, and Kimi is speaking in Japanese. Her pleas for them to keep protecting the towers goes in one ear and out the other, except for Katana and Superman who can speak Japanese, so Dr. Light can at the very least explain to them what they need to keep doing. After another scene transitioning in showing Wonder Woman with her people on Temuskira, we then return to the Monitor's satellite where Pariah has now been brought to. Here the Monitor explains that he had rescued Pariah from his world's destruction, and confesses that it caused him to start going from dying world to another. Pariah is naturally not happy to hear this after everything he has gone through, but the Monitor is too weak to argue with him by now, and instead tries to spend what time he has left to explain that Earth 2 and Earth 1 are going to be next, while showing the heroes and villains fighting a losing battle against the shadow creatures. Pariah is confused at the methods that the monitor has been using, but now has finally come the point 
where Harbinger's infection has reached the point where she comes and kills the monitor. Harbinger disappears after she has committed the murder, and so Pariah is left alone on the satellite to cry while tending to the monitor's remains, as the antimatter finally reaches both Earth 1 and Earth 2 to kill everyone on them. <laughs> Quick run through. Good start in introducing the major players. George Perez's art is phenomenal in drawing everyone so that you can hear their voices in their most emotional scenes, and then the pacing gets both rushed and slowed down there near the end. Especially when the third issue ends with the Harbinger confronting the monitor, and the fourth issue waiting before that was picked up at the end of it. Also, the dialogue could have been better in some places, but with those nitpicks out of the way, let's talk more about it while doing the comparison between the comic and the adaptation. Seriously, what the hell does this have to do with the... to do with Crisis on Infinite Earth? Why are we not getting what is in this book? Wait, hey, 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 hey. I only half remember Why the hell does Barry have green eyes? Happens the day we get Wally has green eyes. Something made you. We're already one oh, an hour in, and we're just getting to this part. Jim Krieg. We meet again, and you probably don't even know who I am. I have previously criticized you for Gotham by Gaslight and the Flashpoint Paradox for things you wrote in them, and what you could have written into them instead. In this adaptation's case, we can probably start how almost half of it is filler that barely gets justified by the end. On one hand, it can be justified as the last second add-on montage of consisting stories or storylines that could have been told in movies that had to be cannibalized into this one. Also, Pariah is replaced with this homeless man, who is definitely voiced by Matt Ryan, who played John Constantine in the CW and the Decamo movies. You must believe. You must bear witness. That tells me that I need to do separate movie reviews on the previous The Camo movies and the Tomorrowverse movies in between when these crimes movies are coming out. The crime syndicate is given a more extended role when they are introduced to show how they are an evil version of the Justice League, and in my opinion on how underutilized they have been on the animated front. Feel free to go watch my video on Crisis on Two Earths for more specifics, but that establishment shown before they die pretty much the same way as in the comic ends up going a little too far when they are shown to have killed their version of Lex Luthor, meaning that we probably won't be getting Alexander Junior in parts 2 and 3. Next thing to mention is no shadow creatures, meaning that Harbinger never gets infected to kill the monitor, because the monitor doesn't die yet, and instead of Lila, Supergirl is Harbinger in this movie. Then there is how most of the heroes in the movie are brought into the loop of what is going on instead of just a select few, with Kimi Hoshi being turned into the new Doctor Light when they are brought onto the monitor satellite. Psycho Pirate is also among them, but he doesn't do Paskakaan. Then when it comes to the towers on five different Earths, they are quickly identified as tuning forks, and instead of being completed in needing protection from the shadow creatures, the heroes are expected to build them before the antimatter waves reach their Earths. Also, for people like Jared and Teladia, the movie pulled a kingdom come with the Earth 2 Superman and Wonder Woman by pairing them up in their old age after their Lois and Steve have passed away. And apparently the main Tomorrowverse Batman never took Nick Grayson in as Robin, as he doesn't recognize the Earth 2 Robin when meeting him on the monitor satellite with Earth 2 Huntress. Then there is how the Flash is made to be the closest thing to a point-of-view character, with that filler I mentioned earlier. 
it not only tries to catch up with the stories of probably cancelled movies about Amazo and how Barry met Iris, who has been Get out! Fed, along with Wally West because we live in the post-CW world, and in leading up to how they were about to get married when the crisis struck. In the comic, the Flash was introduced with that vision Batman had, before he was then shown to be in the future being devoured by the antimatter. In the movie, it is implied that Constantine turned Pariah put a spell onto Barry to make his mind jump back and forth in time so he could have a montage of all that filler. It's also that Barry, who in the comic dies alone in a heroic sacrifice in issue 8, to which I will get to when part 2 comes out, dies in a somewhat similar heroic sacrifice in the movie in the monitor's place. When it comes to that point where the antimatter waves are advancing the five remaining Earths, with the tuning fork tower still not finished, Barry uses the speed force to slow down the time around him and Iris, so they can spend the rest of their lifespans to finish up the one tower in their Earth, before Iris dies of old age and Barry dies powering up the towers, because they are apparently weaker versions than in the comic. Also, the Spectre is shown earlier in the movie than when he appears later in the comic. And that is pretty much how the animated movie compares with the comic book for better and for worse. With all those differences, it's going to be interesting to see how parts 2 and 3 are going to go in comparison to issues 5 through 12. Since we don't have a release date for when part 2 will be coming out, I should be able to write down the story commentary for the rest of the comic before the adaptation continues, and so have the follow-up to this video come out closer to when part 2 does. Until then, remember to like this video, comment what you think about the differences between the comic and the movie down below, share this video for more people to see, and subscribe for when the follow-up comes out along with other videos I'll be doing this year. Ding the bell for when I'll be doing gameplay streams for a chance to chat with me, and may your heart be your guiding key.